We are Multifamily Masters. This is Multifamily Masters Live. We do this once a month. We get on here and we add as much value as possible. Free content. Um, feel free to ask all the questions you want. Type them in the chat below. Type in the chat below where you're from. And if you find value in tonight's broadcast, I would love it if you would share this. We do this free. We do this every month. Our goal is simply to add as much value to you as possible. We want everybody closing deals. We want everybody involved in real estate because plain and simple, Mr. Pauci, Mr. Ferris Musa, Mr. Ben Settles and myself, plain and simple, we want to partner with you. And tonight we have special guest, uh, Disrupt Equity, which is my business partners, Mr. Ferris Musa, Mr. Ben Settles. They're going to go over the complete life cycle of a recent deal that they did in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, go ahead and take it away, fellas. Uh, pal, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Real yeah, quick? sure. I appreciate, appreciate that. Thanks, Garrison. So um, my name is Powell Chi. I am a real estate investor. I live in Los Angeles. Um, do all my real estate investing outside of LA, so outside of California in general. Um, and I would say that primarily I've been a multifamily investor, but I've also recently uh, been a uh, having a lot of success in the self-storage industry. So I have a lot of self-storage as well. Um, but super happy to, to have this panel here today. I guess this panel of two, uh, Ferris, and, Ferris and Ben, guys that I've known for a while, um, watched them for a while, um, partner with them on a, on a couple deals as well. And, um, and definitely people that you should be listening to and, and great people in the industry. Not only as just uh, investors, as, but just as people. So super happy that they're here. Um, yeah, do you guys want to introduce yourselves? All right, thanks guys. Um, so for those that don't know me, I'm Ferris Musa, Disrupt Equity. Also involved closely with Garrison and Powell on kind of continuing to really build up uh, multifamily masters. Um, my background in software worked at Microsoft and after that had a software company then really kind of stumbled into real estate, fell in love with its people's numbers, systems. You know, three things that I love and started Disrupt Equity and we've been rock and rolling. So we currently buy properties throughout Texas and Georgia. A lot of deals have gone full cycle. I think we're selling six deals this year, going five or six. Five. And, uh, you know, and obviously one of the deals that we sold earlier this year is one of the deals that we're going to talk about. So, you know, for those that don't know, Ben and I were both very candid guys, blunt guys, happy to kind of share behind the, the scenes as to what it all takes and what kind of goes on. And maybe last thing I'll add is I'm the more handsome half of Disrupt Equity. So I'll let Ben uh, kind of introduce himself. You had to throw that one in. I had right? to throw that in there. I thought you were going to throw a bald joke in there too, right? <laughs> so no, anyway, everybody, Ben Suttles, uh, as Ferris mentioned, we are Disrupt Equity. Uh, we buy multifamily. Uh, we also do other commercial real estate projects like ground up development and redevelopment, uh, both here in Texas as well as in Georgia. Uh, we bought and sold almost 3,000 units at this point. Uh, have close to 2000 right now. We also have a property management company that manages here in Texas. It's called Disrupt Management. It not only manages our assets, uh, but we've also opened it up to our friends and colleagues in the, in the industry. And we do do a little bit of third party. So if you guys ever have an asset in Texas looking for, um, you know, a property management company to run some, run some comps, run, put a budget together for you, want us just to kind of take a look at it you know we're always happy to do that we run that with a gal named jackie jackson who's the president of the property management company so you know we're excited to kind of talk about marketplace square tonight guys so this was 152 unit property that we bought back in 2019 in atlanta it's close to the airport uh everybody told us that we were crazy and that we overpaid and all this stuff right you know but we ultimately knew that this was a good business model a good business plan. And we knew that we could ultimately execute it with the team that we put in place. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen if I can. Yeah. Uh, Kyle, can, um, you, can you make us co-host, please? Yeah, sure. Hold on one second here. I'm on my phone, so I wasn't prepared to do all this stuff. But yeah, let me get this going here. Good. Co-host. All right. All right. Can everybody see the screen there good to go mm -hmm. yep all right all right so let me see if i can get this into the good old presentation mode here okay all right so we are here multifamilymasters.com people we are excited so i'm going to go ahead and 
we don't need to really go through an agenda. I think uh, Pal and Garrison did a great job there. You know, we're pretty candid. Next virtual meetup looks like it's going to be September 20th. So stay tuned. I'm sure we're going to have some good content of that one as well. So disclaimer, we are not lawyers. We are not CPAs. We are not financial advisors. All of this information, ultimately, it's true and it happened with us. But, you know, what you learn here is for entertainment purposes only. You need to obviously consult with your legal and financial professionals for your specific situation. Got to get that out of the way here. Um, so like we talked about, and I'm going to let Ferris do most of this. I'll chime in as possible. Yeah. And then maybe one thing to add, right? We love Q&A. So if you have questions, comments, you know, definitely start asking them. We will all moderate the Q&A as we progress. But really, like we said, this is a deal that we bought in April of 2019 and we sold it in May of 2021, right, Ben? Correct. It was May, I think. So Correct. About two, three months ago, we closed on it. And hey, really quickly, first, first, really quickly, yeah. you're, you're in sort of the presentation mode where we can see like half the, the oh, next slide coming up. Uh, I see. Yeah. I see what you're saying. So All right, I'm glad you, uh, what do you want me to do here? Can um, you just listen? One of these. Where's this one? Just start clicking buttons. What's the worst that can happen? All right. Hey, I was just there selling IT, all right? He was the actual smart one, all right? So <laughs> bear with me here while my IT guy fixes this. Sorry, I was just trying to get you guys some insight into my next slide. <laughs> get a little previews. Hang tight, guys. Bear with me here. And while they're setting this up, we are multifamily <laughs> masters. And we have a mastermind. If you're interested in learning, sharing, networking, growing this business, if you're interested in surrounding yourself with like-minded people, if you are interested in having someone with experience looking over your shoulder and holding you accountable, feel free to email gg at multifamilymasters.com for more information on Ferris, Pal, Ben, and my mastermind, multifamilymasters.com. Rock and roll, fellas. All right. So as we were saying, so property we sold this past May, right? And really, we're just going to kind of talk through kind of what we told our investors, right? What the pitch was, how we found the deal. And then from that, really just kind of talk a little bit more about just what it took to get it forming. And then ultimately how we sold, you know, what, what the sell looked like, right? So, and one thing I wanted to add, so the condition was a little bit rough, right? You know, I think we had 30 yeah. down units, as we mentioned here, and a ton of other CapEx. Um, the, comp the company that we bought it from had actually bought it, and I think it was 13% occupied whenever they bought it. And I think we bought it, and it was maybe high 70s, low 80s in terms of occupancy. So, um, you know, it, it, was, it was a heavy lift that they had done. We are also prepared to do a heavy lift as well. So just wanted to preface the- Yeah, and, the and we'll show that. kind of the, the summary and the math that we did and why we knew this deal was just going to be kind of a grand slam. And so with that, with that said, right, this is really what the kind of what we like to call the executive summary to our investors, right? This kind of talks about the key things we saw, what we liked about it. So essentially, we projected 17% average annualized returns to our investors, right? We we're expecting about a little over a double in six years. We're spending about a million dollars on CapEx, right? And really, there's kind of three big things that we really liked about this deal. First and foremost is the location, right? It's not an A area of Atlanta, but it's absolutely in a growing kind of, we would have called, what would you call it, about a C plus area, B minus? No, I'd say B minus. Yes, B minus area. But the big thing is there was a huge new development that went in, Caddy Corner, right? That development, does, you know, brings with it jobs and it brings with it a lot of research, right? There was a Starbucks that we only knew this area because there was a Starbucks that area. It's pretty much the only Starbucks in West and South Atlanta, right? So again, Starbucks doesn't just put up Starbucks as willy nilly, right? There's a lot of research that goes into it. So again, we knew that they had done had done a lot of kind of the, the studies around population growth, job growth. And so that was really kind of the big thing we saw on location, right? And with that employment, again, a lot of jobs. This deal is literally you could throw a football field across the highway, uh, sorry, throw a football across the highway and you're already at this big development, right? A lot going on there, let alone it's really close to the airport. And there's, after buying this deal, we found out kind of a lot of announcements around just big projects going in close to the airport, right? And last but not least, I think this is the big money piece, literally and figuratively, right? Was the upgrades that had been done. And we have a slide coming up that'll show the breakdown. But really the current owners had already done $2.7 million in upgrades, right? They had upgraded 88 unit interiors to get really a high rent. 
And ultimately, you know, Ben and I, we're not really trailblazers. We don't want to be the ones that are on the, the bleeding edge of rents and trying to say, hey, we can push the rents to the extreme. We like deals. And as a buyer, right, you all should too, buy deals with proven value add, right? Not just one or two deals where someone, some, you know, maybe some sucker paid too much for it. But in this case, I mean, they had already done 88 units, right? They showed the, the pathway of what needs to be done. All we needed to do is continue doing that exact same thing. And, and last but not least, right, we found out the, the FAA, which is the, the aviation kind of division of the government, right? They had, the property had already got approved for doing what's called the noise reduction program. So as part of Atlanta, Atlanta's expansion of the airport, right, there was a lot of money set aside for airport, for properties in the flight paths of the airport to essentially get noise reduction done for them. And what that really means is, you know, brand new windows, brand new sliding glass doors, brand new front doors, right? It really to the tune of about $2 million on this specific asset. And so if we go to the next slide, right, kind of the summary, right? We talked about it a little bit. And again, decently sized units, you can see what those upgrades look like, right? Nice interiors, um, you know, nothing super crazy, right? People really just like nice, clean quality and affordable living. Right? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would just add that, you know, on an average unit size, that is actually probably bigger than normal. But what people may, might not know about Atlanta is I think they're either top two or top three in the country and major metros as far as unit size. So take that into consideration. That's what's also somewhat slightly driving asset prices too, right? Because the more square footage that you can rent, the more rent you can get. So therefore that affects asset prices. So, um, you know, typically just to give you guys some perspective right here in, in Texas, you're typically going to see probably closer to 850, 900. And that's in Texas where everything's supposed to be bigger, right? So uh, just some metrics on the, on the property itself, you know, but let's do some math, man. What do you say? Yeah, so really this is the slide I want everyone to pay attention to, right? Because it makes this deal a no brainer. If I could go back, I'd buy this deal again. And really, I'd go back and buy any deal I'd never bought, but that's a different problem, <laughs> right? So again, do the math. On this deal, $2.7 million had gone into the property from the current owners. So 90% of the HVAC was brand new. 90% of the water heaters is brand new. All new siding, new railing and balconies, and 50% of the units were already upgraded nicely, right? In addition to that, the airport was going to put in another $2 million to replace those windows, front doors, and balconies like we talked about. And so... You know, with that, we were also going to put in about a million dollars. And so on this property, right, pretty much in three years, there would have been about six million dollars in improvements on a deal that we were buying for nine million dollars. Right. So it's, you know, that kind of really, in my mind, speaks for itself. Right. And really, we liked this deal because it boiled down to two things, bringing 30 units online. Right. Which essentially you're making money out of nothing. Right. It was zero cash producing units that are now producing real cash and ultimately doing the upgrades that are already proven, right? What's nice about this deal is that all it really was was sweat equity. Would you agree, Ben? Like it was really, if we can just execute the business plan, we don't have to bet on the market or cash for any of that other stuff. All of that's already been figured out yep. and we like those kinds of deals. Absolutely. And one thing I wanted to mention, you know, first, because I always get this question about this FAA noise reduction program. It's not necessarily tied to Atlanta. There's actually similar programs throughout the country. And essentially what it is, is if you're within the flight path, like within, I think, a five mile radius of a major airport, you know, you can apply for this program on behalf of your property. Now, there's a lot of hoops that you got to go through. There's a lot of paperwork. And that's why it was almost a benefit that the, the former owner had actually gone through and done all the, the heavy lifting and then just assigned the contract to us. But not only did they provide these materials, right? But there was a crew and a, and a legit crew, right? You know, for almost 10 months, these guys were out on site every weekday. And on top of that, they rented eight units from us at market rents to be act, to act as a swing unit. Now, what is a swing unit, right? It's essentially for somebody that's on the third shift, say they get home, right? Well, that's the, during the day, we're trying to get into their units to, you know, obviously install these soundproof windows, front doors and sliding doors. They can't be there. They can't be in the unit. This was even pre-COVID, right? So we asked them to go to one of the swing units and we decked them out. We had beds and we had TVs and we had toiletries and all that other stuff, you know, or think of the, the single mom that's home with their kids, right? You know, so at, for eight or excuse me, 10 months, 
they also rented eight units at market rent, which is pretty nice as well. So that all equates to about $2 million in value that they added to the property. So, you know, I mean, just kind of going through this pretty quickly, as you can see that star there down towards the bottom, right? That's where the property is. And, and like Ferris said, somebody that that's got a pretty good football arm, you know, uh, could probably get that, uh, get it across the highway, maybe potentially, who knows, yeah. or maybe it's a couple of golf swings. Not but, Ben, but, you know, get a pro, and, uh, pro football player. Hey, well, I could probably hit it with a golf ball, but yeah, you can see the target with the big old target on that. I love that, this, this, uh, this picture, but as you can see, there's not only a ton of places for our residents to potentially shop and eat at, right? But those are also potential places where they could they they could work, right? Now, if you go, if you see that Camp Creek Parkway along the bottom right, if you kept following that, probably another two or three miles is when you get to the airport, right? And Atlanta Hartsfield, for people that don't know, is the biggest airport in the world, not in, just in the U.S. in the world, and so it directly and indirectly employs, I think, close to half a million people in and around the South Atlanta area. So it's a big driver for, uh, for not only this property, but for all properties in this area. So let's go through the rehab budget, right? So interior upgrades, obviously we're gonna put about 455,000. We're gonna do a little bit to the office clubhouse. We needed to do some roofs, parking lot, landscaping, you know, update and add in some amenities. We did some signage, solar screens. And for people that don't know what this is, because once we got out of Texas, we realized that most people didn't realize what this was. Um, they're the black screens that you can add to the outside of the windows. And people ask, well, why would you do that, right? Well, it also it gives a uniform look to the property. And it also hides those broken blinds that everybody hates to look at, right? It's just an eyesore. So it kind of aesthetically is pleasing, but it's also good for the property and for the tenant because it, it reduces the electricity spent, right? We had to do some fencing. It had some foundational plumbing issues, which was probably when I was looking at the CapEx, that was probably the biggest you know, a mystery of the whole property, but we had more than enough baked in there yeah. with hundred K. And then on top of that, we always have a buffer or contingency in our, in our um, rehab budget, because as people know that have maybe bought properties, or if you haven't bought them, just realize that there's always going to be things that you're not going to realize are going to pop up. So yeah, always have a contingency. And I would add, as we've grown in our career, we've also learned to just pro uh, kind of really scale the buffer based on the capex that you're doing. Yes. Right. There's just more things that can go wrong. And, you know, and again, this deal's, you know, it wasn't perfect, right? There's a lot of things that kind of had to be worked through. And so really we've just learned in our career to really just be smart about that buffer. Absolutely. And this is separate than, than just reserves that we had, right? This is just CapEx buffer. Yep, yep, yep. So what were some of the pain points? Yeah, so first thing, you know, 30 down units, right? That's a lot of units to work through, get online. And each of them had various degrees of down, right? Some were down to the stud from yep. flooding problems, right? Some were a little bit just kind of rough turns. And so, again, needing to get out there, right? We bought in Atlanta because it's easy to get to Atlanta. Like Ben said, it's the biggest airport in the world. Yep. Pre-COVID, there was eight flights a day to Atlanta for on Southwest. 12 flights. 12 flights <laughs> on Southwest alone. Yes. Right. And so we were able to get out there anytime we need to get out there. Um, you know, and for 30 down units to do, to work through, I mean, that, that's important. Yep. Right. Uh, in addition to that, it just didn't really have many amenities, right? So that was one place to kind of spruce up. Mm -hmm. um, lawsuit waiting to happen on the playground, right? It had a crappy playground. It had kind of some concrete uh, slab that was formerly a building. It just wasn't really that attractive, nor was it that safe. And so, again, we worked through that, replaced that playground. And again, for those that know us, we, we tend to like to make... Ben's shaking his head. What was wrong? No, just keep going. Uh, 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 you know, it, for those that know us, we, we tend to like to make our properties family friendly, right? Implementing things like a playground, really, you know, we love our two, three bedroom units, right? Because of that reason, because guess what? Families tend to stay, right? If you take care of them, they'll take care of the property. So that's a win-win situation. Um, continuing on, right? The roof caved in on the laundromat and, you know, it just, it was a crappy laundromat, right? I mean, Barely qualified that. So again, you know, really spending the capex and time and effort to fix that. Uh, the airport project, as much as much as as nice as it was for the airport to spend two million dollars on a property, right? You know, you had to work around that. I mean, like Ben said, there was a crew of 20, 30 people that I'm never going to complain having 20, 30 people working on a property of ours for free for you know a year almost, right? But you have to work around them. And on top of that, you know, there's a certain code level that they had to make sure each unit met before they did the work, right? Because again, they're putting in really high-end 
front doors, sliding glass doors and windows. And with that means, you know, they, they're, they're heavy, right? They can't just be put into a regular window frame. So there might be some sub floor issues, some things like that they identify that we'd have to work through, let alone, you know, we'd have to play around just which units became available, which units we gave them. And so that's a thing. And then also just staffing, right? Took a little bit to get the right manager and I know how to kind of work with that tenant base and deal with the airport project. Once again, that was a big burden on I remember that first manager really struggled to kind of handle, you know, tenants, getting units aligned, and then also the airport project. Because you got to realize, folks, what was actually happening at this point, right? So new owner, new management company, we had the FAA that was out there. We had our crews doing their CapEx at the same time. Yes, that's true. You know, so, and, and ultimately we were trying to manage the property all, all within that same time frame. And so uh, it would have been a challenge for some, even some seasoned managers, but going back to the airport um, themselves, obviously the airport is, is government, you know, or pseudo government related. And anybody that's done business with the government knows how painful that is. So there's a ton of bureaucracy. There was a ton of meetings, a ton of phone calls, a ton of documentation. And ultimately they made us jump through a, a significant amount of hoops, including doing additional work in order for, you know, cause they would kind of come ahead. They'd have a, a, a crew that went ahead to the next building and then they'd come through and they, they pretty much line item out all the things that we had to do to that building before their crew would step foot in that building. And sometimes it was minimal, sometimes it was significant. Um, you know, Ferris alluded to subfloor issues and, you know, because of the, the, the heaviness of this equipment or this materials, you know, we had to spend, I'd say almost six figures on subfloor repairs uh, throughout the property. And then ultimately once COVID hit, they stopped work immediately and it was a big challenge um, to get them to come back out. They finally did, um, you know, do a few more at the very end. And then ultimately at the end, they just ended up giving us the materials. Uh, for the last, I think, five units, um, because they had already moved on in their minds, and it was real hard for them to kind of stop what they were doing. But uh, so anyway, that's the joy of working with the government, but uh, ultimately added a ton of value to the next buyer. And, you know, it was an interesting project, to say the least. So property financials, you want to go through the fun stuff? Here? Yeah, so it's just kind of this is an older version, but you can really see the asset from when we bought it versus, you know, kind of through right before COVID, actually, right? And so you can see the difference, right? The income significantly growing from 80 to 120. That's a 50% increase in collections alone, right? That's just kind of a, for those that ask, what does value add mean? I mean, that, that's value add, right? Those numbers speak for themselves. You can see the growth of the income. And that really would boil down to A, getting down units online, right? And then B, upgrading certain units as well, right? And so that's really key, guys, right? That's how you drive value. If you look at that, what is $40,000 of increased NOI on a six cap? All right, I'm gonna do that math right now. $40,000, divide that over a six cap. That's an increase of $600,000. No, you gotta do that times 12. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, so yeah. that's why it sounded wrong. Yeah, so there's a, there's I was a gonna say, that didn't sound high enough. There we go, eight, eight, that's $8 million of increased value, arguably, right? Yeah. Now, again, we paid a premium, right? We didn't buy it at market cap because you know, a unit that's offline is not worth zero dollars, right? But it's just kind of a representation of what can be done. Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately a lot of value driven by not only operational, but it was just, that's, that's what I talked about earlier, folks, is that we, we knew what we were getting ourselves into. And it was just a matter of executing that business plan and bringing those units online. You could literally, you, you, you could determine what the value was going to be just in six months, as, as long as you stuck to the plan, right? Whereas some of this stuff where it's a, uh, you know, it's mismanaged and I'm putting that in quotations or there's, there's some other kind of, you know, to be determined value add play there. That's kind of risky in my mind, right? Whereas this, yes, it was a lot more work, but it was, it, it was in my mind, it was a proven path Absolutely. that we could take to increase revenue and therefore obviously increase the value. So, you know, not without a lot of work though, let's just put it that way. So the finish line. So what's all of this equate to? After yeah. All so, I mean, done? you know, you grind it out, guys, right? You implement a business plan, you execute the business plan. And, you know, if you do your job right, right, that results in a performing property that you can then sell. So on this property, right, like I said, we sold it this past May. And these are the final numbers, right? So kind of net, net, net of everything. Investors made pretty much 25% IRR on this deal, right? And about 50% return in, in two years. Right now, yes, we could have held on and continued on and maybe done a refi, but ultimately we we're just sending on a tremendous amount of equity and no investors are going to complain about that little one. I think it ended up 
we're near the finish line, but I think it ends up being about 55, right? We were doing the math yeah, the other day. Close, yeah, it's close, so like it's actually came in higher than this yeah. even, right? Yeah. But again, you, you over, under deliver, under promise, over deliver, guys. You know, so I mean, it was a matter of obviously bringing those down units online, you know, finishing up the airport program, you know, and ultimately spending, you know, the, the CapEx budget that we had and improving it. But we left some meat on the bone for the next buyers group. And that's ultimately what they bought, uh, bought it on. And, you know, we just knew that asset prices were kind of going through the roof already in Atlanta and they've continued to go up. Right. You know, but, you know, this guy still has a little bit of work ahead of him. And, you know, but he was excited because he felt like he got it at a good basis. Yeah. And that's ultimately what you want to do as a seller. You want to leave a little bit of meat on the bone. Don't be that person that's going to, you know, try to sell some turnkey property because believe it or not, there's less buyers of turnkey than there are a value add. Right. You think, oh, well, don't people just like a clean deal that they can just step into? Yeah, but you can't push the value as much there. Right. You're buying it at a premium at that point. Unless you're going to buy it yourself and sit on it for 10 or 20 years, you're just not going to make the money that you need or that you want to make on these types of assets. Right. So you want that value add component. So really and that's really what the brokers are. are they have it. They'll even tell you themselves. Right. Trying to sell a turnkey deal versus selling a value add deal is a lot more challenging. And so we left a little bit of meat on the bone and that was the story. And, and ultimately we had a gentleman that was out of New Jersey and, you know, he saw the value and he ultimately was able to close on it in May. And so we're excited. So boom, we blew through that, man. I think we need to do a little bit of Q and A. Yeah, you say? we went to the Q and A. So with that said, like I said, we're Q and A guys. So Powell Garrison, do one of you guys want to moderate the Q and A for us? Yeah, sure. We're gonna, let me do that for a second here. People Eight have questions, minutes. comments. Go ahead and drop it. We'll answer just about it. Yeah, and it doesn't have to necessarily be um, about this deal. We can just talk real estate in general. Um, so, you know, feel free to drop some drop some questions. We can talk about the market as well. Yeah, so if you do have any any other uh, questions, definitely put them in there. We're going to start off with a few that uh, that, were, that were put in the chat. But uh, if you have any more, then put them inside the chat and we'll go we'll get to them as well. So uh, Bernadette uh, asked, or no, actually, she just, uh, sorry, I'm going to start with David. David, uh, David Kizita, he asked, uh, what went wrong with the deal and how did you course correct? There are several things that went wrong with this deal. Um, I would say that the first and foremost, you know, pre-COVID, having a property near, near Atlanta Hartsfield was almost a no-brainer because it was the biggest driver of the economy in that, that part of South Atlanta. And there's a ton of jobs in and around the airport. Once COVID hit, um, of course, everybody knows what happened to air travel, right? For six months, people were either furloughed or, or laid off, and, and it still hasn't gotten back to pre-COVID levels. So I would say that was probably the first challenge, and you know that led to a high amount of delinquency. In fact, on a percentage basis, this was probably the highest delinquency property that we had. And you know, I, I, we have a great property management company. Um, in Atlanta that we work with, Province Realty, and they did a great job managing it. But at the end of the day, you know, people were employed by, you know, an industry that had gotten shuttered or slowed down during COVID. So I'd say that was the biggest thing. So you had to really work with the tenants. Some of them were, were cool about it. Some of them were downright belligerent about it. You know, I mean, there's there some times when, when Art, who's the, the president of, of Province, said, hey, look, you know, I kind of fear for the safety of our, our of our staff when they're going and knocking on some of these doors, we might have to back off a little bit, right? So we then we took a different approach, you know, um, and, and try to really put the, the rental relief applications on a silver platter and do a majority of the heavy lifting for them. And in that case, a lot of them were, were a little bit more apt to, to work with us. So I'd say the biggest challenge was obviously having a property that was close to Atlanta Hartsfield, having to deal with that delinquency portion. On top of obviously you're in a, you're in the process of doing a lease up, right? We had down units, so we were we were trying to deal with delinquency, and then you were trying to lease it up at the same time. While COVID was happening, while COVID was happening, um, and, and ultimately it made it more challenging for me and Ferris to get out to the property um, because those twelve flights a day that used to go from Houston went down to like two or three, and we could no longer do yeah, a day trip. We used to day trip at Atlanta, guys. Yeah. Maybe we didn't make that clear. Literally, morning flight out there, night flight back. Yeah. Wake up and sleep in our own bed. And that's important, right? Getting out to a property easily is important. Buying a property in New York, Maine, you know, Oregon, besides the fact those aren't landlord friendly places, right? Those are hard places to get to. I mean, they're long from us, flights. From us. Yeah. yeah, from here. You're near one of those places by all means, right? And so really pick an investment place so you can get out to easier, especially if you're doing 
you know, a deeper value add. This property is not a cookie cutter. It's a deeper value add. There's a lot to do. The first year was very hands-on. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say that's the biggest challenge. I mean, there's, uh, there's certainly others, but I don't want to bore everybody with every little up and down. Sure. There's always going to nope. be on all of these properties. Uh, but I would say really that was, those were the major challenges is the shut, the shuttering of Atlanta Hartsfield and then the delinquency that led to from, from that. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good. Um, great. So how about uh, Bernadette uh, Brooks has asked, uh, how do you calculate your buffer? You guys talked about that earlier, but yeah, let's talk about the buffer. You know, there's, there's a simplistic way to do it. You know, you take five to 10% of your overall budget, right? You know, that's kind of the rule of thumb, but I think Ferris brought up a good point, right? I'd say that you need to have more buffer for bigger, deeper value at, you know, uh, projects, right? Would you say? It's a sliding scale, guys. Yeah. It depends on what you're doing. If I just need to replace kitchen countertops in every unit, there's very small room for error on something like that. A normal rule like Ben said, 10%, by all means, that could be done. But if I have foundation issues, I have landscaping problems, drainage problems, I have siding, I have roof problems, all these other things, yeah. those are much more risk prone things, right? And so, on a, you know, we're at the point, I guess, in our career where raising another two, three, four hundred thousand dollars of buffer, right? While that waters the returns a little bit, it makes it a much safer deal for all investors. And so really... People should think about that, right? I think everyone really tries to squeeze the most juice from a deal, right? But you're doing it at the cost of risk and headache, potential room for headache. And we've just learned that it's just, you know, it's safer, better to play it safe. But, you know, on that deal, I'm trying to think like, what buffer would you say we should have had? You know, we said 120, we really should have had 300. 300 yeah. would have probably been about ideal on that deal in hindsight, right? So double what we initially did. Yeah, there was just, a, there was a lot more work to do on the down units than, I mean, we inspected them, folks. It wasn't like we, we didn't, but what you have to realize about down units, and maybe this is just something that everybody should, should hear this advice, right? You know, whatever your GC thinks it's going to be, add something to that, right? They think it's going to be 20,000 a door. It's probably going to be 25,000 a door because at the end of the day, you don't know how long they've been, you know, um, you know, not, not taken care of. There's going to be electrical work. There's going to be plumbing work. There's going to be permits and permitting throughout the process. You're essentially having to redo everything if the unit's been offline for more than a year. And so, you know, that, that adds cost. And then on top of that, you're doing everything from flooring to appliances to cabinets, which cabinets alone are going to cost you, I'd say three to five grand, depending on the, the configuration. And I, you know, and just to, just to add, I mean, Right. This is coming from us and we've done pretty much hundreds of units online, yes. right? From a property that hundred percent, like half the units flooded. So we've done a lot of down units, right? And it just, they come with headache. You need to kind of plan for them accordingly. So keep that in mind. Awesome. Awesome. It's good info on there. So um, how about this? Manuel Russell, uh, Manuel asks, why did you guys sell it? So, you know, I'm going to answer. So no. This deal, like you guys saw, right? We planned for a six-year hold, but ultimately, this sort of, we are firm believers in and being opportunistic, right? Yeah. We don't believe in holding investor money just to hold the money, right? There's a strong exit. Someone else can take it to another level. Then we're going to make that exit because guess what? The next guy that bought it, he paid a little bit of a premium for it because he sees meat on the bone, right? So people will pay up a little bit for that. To give you guys even another example, Ben and I were talking about another deal that we looked at here in Houston, the property's already updated. There's no meat on the yeah. bone. We, we, you know, we're like, we don't, even they're asking, it feels good as a price per pound, but there's not really much upside to juice it. And so we're not even willing to pay a, a fair market price yeah. on that deal versus a different deal. They're asking a premium, but it's got runway to push rents. And so, you know, if you really tie that school of thought back to investors, right, we can maximize their dollar by essentially making an exit when someone will pay us that premium. And so we will always try to do that. And again, we're selling five deals this year, right? They're all varying degrees of someone is willing to pay a premium. We've already, you know, overperformed what we presented and rock and roll. So. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, you have to realize what have you projected to your investors and where are you at in the market? Right. I think that, yeah, could we have held on to it? Yeah. Could we have refinanced? And we looked at all those options. Right. But ultimately, in order to monetize the deal and, and get the, the highest yield to our investors, it was to sell at that point. And, and a lot of that was driven by the Atlanta market. I mean, it's just been on fire. We got into Atlanta 
three or four years ago. And within a year, it's just, it just started taking off and it's, it's gone up. Yeah, well, we have 20, 30% just this year alone. We have, we have actually, we have two more deals in Atlanta we're selling. One closes tomorrow and another one's closing later that pal you're a part of. And that deal we were not mm-hmm. intending. We didn't think we'd sell that no. deal anytime soon. No. Right. I mean, it's the deal's done well. We've, we've gotten $400 rent premiums. Like really the rents compared to what we bought it at two years ago are $400 higher. And we're not talking about from 1600 to 2000. We're talking from 800 to $1,200, right? 50% increase. And we, you know, we did, we, we did that deal low leverage. We were just ready to hold that deal for a while. Right. But again, strong return. I mean, home run to investors, even with paying a prepay penalty on the deal, right? We, we still made the decision that it's best to make that exit for investors. Yeah. And, and ultimately, everybody was excited about it. You know, I think that, you know, most people, they want to keep their money working for them. Right. You know, and so if they can take that 25 percent IRR return and then they can roll it into the next deal or into somebody else's deal and, and keep churning their money every two, three, four years, that's how you're going to get wealthy. You know, I mean, you know, if you've got your 50K wrapped up for 10 years. Right. You know, maybe you make 100K at the end of the day. Right. But I would say from an IRR basis, it's not a great play. Right. So it's always good to pull, take your money off and, and keep rolling it. And I, and I think if you really crunch the numbers, you see that I'm that that's a correct statement. Right. You're going to you're going to make more return overall if you continue to put your money to work. Yeah, there's good points. Good points. Um, let me see. Moving on. Uh, Chris Oxendeen asks on the financials. And I saw this, too. There it says other on other income. What did you change over the course of the year to boost that? your other income. A lot of that other income was just, you have more units online, right? So it's going to go up. Um, So more people are paying, you know, for example, rubs, right? So electricity, water, some of the billbacks that we have, right? Mm -hmm. Again, 30 units is a significant portion of of the property. So you just have more people paying fees, that fee, right? Let alone, you know, more application fees because you're leasing more units. You're doing a lot more of kind of that upfront and really continue to push that. So it's just a combination of all of those things. Yeah. So it's a lot of your fees and your rubs and things like that. Uh, you just had yeah, more, most more of that. Is, is application fees, pe- uh, late fees, rubs. Uh, what else, Ben? Would you I say? mean, sometimes Pet not on this fees, property, but you're like going to have that. like parking yeah. and, and all, you know, your, your laundromat income. I mean, anything that's not rent, folks, is other income. So, you know, and, and sometimes you can break up other income into fees and then utility reimbursements, which we call rubs. So sometimes you'll see a, a distinction there, but just assume and keep in, in, in your mind here that anything is not rent is other income. And this one was just an easy, you know, you're just going to stair step it because at the end of the day, you were increasing the occupancy of the property. And so more people, therefore more fees. Yep. Awesome. Um, cool. I like this question here. It says, how did you all meet um, and become partners? You guys have a good rapport. They, they must recognize your chemistry. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people say that, but ultimately we became friends first. You know, I mean, Ferris was, you know, coming out. I was running a networking event uh, similar to this one, yeah, right we, now. We, now we, it is the MFM yeah, chapter. Yeah, we, we met Houston. at the current, you know, Houston MFM chapter. Yeah, right. So yeah. we, you know, again, that networking is key, right? You know, I saw, I met Ben, got to know him, right? Talked a little shop, you know, found a deal working together, kind of clicked, and you know, we rocked and roll. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, you I was know, trying to work in a joke there, but I couldn't quite think of it on the spot while I was talking. I'll let you, I'll so. let you, I'll let you think it over. But yeah, I was looking at me intently, I was, wondering I was what joke I was going to draw. I was waiting for the ball joke to come yeah. in. But anyway, so the the partnership is a lot like a marriage, folks. Right? You need to court a little bit. So ultimately, me and Ferris, you know, we had known each other for probably I think nine months or so before really disrupt equity kicked off. And you know, we're getting to know each other. We looked at some deals. We underwrote some stuff. You know, ultimately, that's the most important thing, right? You got to like, know, and trust the person that you're that you're going to be doing business with. And this is not like a deal partner, right? This is an actual partnership, so it's a little bit more permanent. And uh, you know, we 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 took it seriously, and you know, ultimately, I think our our personalities jive pretty well. But yeah, I mean, networking works, and so you just have to get out there and and make those connections. And ultimately, if you're looking for a partner, these types of you know webinars or just even in the person the in person events. Or where are you going to find your next partner? Mm-hmm. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I mean, I know that for me personally, I found my business partner through through my meetup as well. It's just like you know, coming to my meetup, and and I know that I was going to calculate. I was wanting to calculate how many partnerships MFM has created, but I, there's no way I can calculate that. I, but 
there's been a lot uh, just through, you know, just through MFM, a lot of business partnerships have come through it. So um, good. So let's see, uh, Jason Lewis, appreciate your question. It says, when you bought it, did you assume the existing financing? If so, what were the terms? Nope, Maybe. that was all cash. We went with a bridge loan from a, a company called Bank Corp. And, uh, you know, they gave us an $8 million loan that included, uh, you know, a fair amount of our, our repair uh, budget as well. And so, yeah, no, this was not going to be an assumption. So, mm -hmm. and typically, not that we wouldn't do an assumption. We absolutely would if the deal made sense. But, you know, with this low, you know, interest rate environment that we find ourselves in, debt is cheap, folks, you know. So don't go in and try to assume a 5% interest rate when you can get a 3 in today's environment, that's, you know, the, the deal, they have to be, have to be, you know, giving you a pretty good deal on the purchase price for you to assume that loan. Unless you're buying one of our deals. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, yeah, no. I was going to say, you guys, uh, it might, it must've worked out with your, your strategy to have like this bridge loan. Cause it's probably a, what, a two or three year loan and probably. Uh, it was a three year. A, it's a three. So we typically, if we're going to do a bridge, we do a three year with a one, one. When people always ask, what's the one, one it's, two one-year extensions and there's some tests that you have to go through to get the extension right but ultimately we sold it before the the initial term was even up but you know the reason that you go with bridge in a lot of cases especially back prior to when interest rates are now as low as they are is when you're going to be increasing the value of the property significantly right you know because you want to you want to realize that 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 increase in the value right and you want to you want to realize that through either a refinance or a sale, right? And if you're in long-term permanent debt, you have prepayment penalties and it's harder for you to exit that property at a profitable, you know, um, you know, return to your investors. So something to think about, right? You know, um, and I think, you know, which is a little bit different of a case right now with why, why people are using bridge as a tool. Uh, it's not necessarily because they're going to see significant value increases. And I, th I think in some areas they might still see that. It's just because Fannie and Freddie are getting their you know, their teeth kicked in because, you know, their leverage is so low and people have gotten into these fanny jails where they can't sell the property because the prepayment bill is too high. So they're saying, hey, screw that. I'll go with bridge, uh, execute my business plan and then flip out of it. Yeah. So, and I mean, in this year alone, we're going to pay $7 million in prepay penalties. Yeah. Which is, is significant. Right? I mean, you know, that would have been fantastic to keep that. We're still, investors are still stoked, but imagine had we gotten to keep that, right? So, you know, we, you start to get smarter around, giving yourself more options on the exit, right? If the market stays hot and you would make an exit sooner, get yeah. smarter. So, And one thing that, that I've mentioned, right, just because we, we, we seem to have a PhD on financing because we've made every freaking mistake in the book. But, you know, one, one product that we do like, if you want something that's more permanent, look into a Freddie or a Fannie floater. Freddie's got a little bit better product, um, you know, but that's going to give you the- With a tight cap. With a tight cap. So I'll yeah, get to that in a minute, but because you know, I don't want to- <laughs> don't confuse everybody, but the floater is essentially, it's a variable rate, right? But you can buy an interest rate cap, right? Which is essentially insurance. So if your rate spikes, the insurance kicks in and pays off the Delta, right? So just think of that. That's what an interest rate cap is, right? But it gives you the flexibility. There's a one-year lockout on it. And then it's 1% of the loan amount for the rest of the term. And you can get it for 10, 12 years if you want it as well. So it gives you it gives you that flexibility of, and typically the interest rate, because it's based off of SOFR is, I mean, we've got an interest rate right now on, on a deal that we just bought here in Houston. It's 2.85, you know, on a 10 year note with five years interest only. So you really can't beat that. So if you yeah. want to have a permanent loan, but you don't, cause you don't really want to go with bridge, um, you know, but you want to have the benefit of having some flexibility on the prepayment penalty, check out the floater. I think that's a, huge gold nugget that you just gave to everybody because I've never really heard anybody really talking about Freddie's floaters and doing a, a you know insurance cap or a, or a cap with it as well. So that's a huge good gold nugget for everybody here. Um, and, and a lot of times we don't really get into like prepayment penalties and how they affect people. But, you know, going into this where you're talking about the whole life cycle of a deal, I mean, that's where we can get into like, you know, uh, prepayment penalties and how you know, they could hurt you in the sort of near term and, and something that people don't look at, you know, when they're, when they're really kind of putting the, the deals together. So. Yeah. And one thing just to add to pal is, you know, I mean, on any bridge deal, not just a, a Freddie floater, but on any bridge deal, you have to buy an interest rate cap. The reason that they, they force you to buy that 
is because they don't want to see interest rates spike. And then you go back to them saying, well, crap, guys, I can't pay my note. My interest is 10% now, right? Now, nobody, nobody that's in the know thinks that interest rates are going anywhere, but probably staying where they're at for quite some time. They're not going to 10, I'll tell you that. But there's always that risk that something could happen and it spikes, right? So the, the lender doesn't want to see you not be able to pay their note either. So they force you to buy the cap, right? So, you know, but on a bridge loan, typically it's maybe a half a point to a point as far as, uh, you know, uh, a prepayment penalty, which is significantly cheaper than yield maintenance or defeasance. No, the deal is, we're selling tomorrow, literally, I saw the thing, it's a $3.6 million note and we're paying a million and $60,000 penalty. So almost 30% of the loan amount and its penalty. And that's three years after we bought it. Yeah, three years after we bought that deal. So you yeah. can imagine that that's a- 30% is a lot more than 1%, guys, so. Yeah, yeah so just take yeah. that into consideration. I'm not, I'm not advocating go bridge or do anything. Ultimately, you need to talk with your mortgage broker, your lender about your options. But you know the reason that people are now knee-jerking back to bridge is because they got hosed. You know, that was the, that was the Kool-Aid that we were, we were told to, to go with for so long. Right. And, uh, you know, then, then when asset prices started taking off, people were getting jammed up, but they couldn't sell their deals. So, you know, something to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, uh, uh, Barry, uh, Barry Griffiths, I appreciate your question. I think most of it was answered really it was about bridge, you know, type of loan and everything. So, and it's lessons learned. So I think that that question was answered. If it wasn't Barry, just just write back, uh, right back into the uh, into the chat, okay? And so, Joanne Ling, you asked, uh, how many years have you had the property? Uh, is this a syndication company? I think Ben, you got you can your affairs can answer that pretty quickly. We, we had it in the in the the uh, presentation. We bought it in in 2019. We sold it in May of this year. Um, so we had it for two years. Yes, we syndicated the equity. Disrupt Equity as a whole syndicates equity with investors, right? Yep. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Lizanette, Lizanette uh, Valiz, you asked, um, have any of the aspects of the asset selection criteria changed during COVID? And if so, how? And do you plan to go back to your previous criteria or keep the current approach moving forward? So kind of like how has COVID affected your, um, you know, your asset selection criteria and what are the changes and or um, yeah. how are you approaching that now moving forward? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, certainly we've, you know, I, I think it's, 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 it's not only necessarily COVID, but as you kind of, you know, progress in your career as, as, as we are in syndication, right. Your ability to raise more equity uh, just goes up. Right. So therefore you tend to chase bigger deals, maybe nicer deals where there's more equity that you have to bring to the table. So um, that plus, you know, just looking for nicer deals because of COVID and what we've learned from COVID would be would be how I'd answer that. But I would also say that if we came across this deal where once again we could literally line out what the value increase was going to be and there was a there was a defined business plan, we'd absolutely do this deal again. Yeah. And I would add one more thing, right? You know, with COVID, unfortunately just cap rates have compressed so much that the difference between a C class and a B class, it's really gotten pretty small. We were literally talking yeah. about that earlier today. Right. The caps between them is so minuscule that ultimately, you know, why would I pay that price point for a 25 year older property versus I pay a little bit more and I get a 25 year newer property. Right. And so that's that's really, I would say, the biggest driver of what's kind of led us to focus more on kind of B, even A class properties. Right. It's that spread between the C and the B has gotten so small and even the C and the A. Right. That people are. Right now, I mean, you're seeing guys that slit each other's throats for that aggressive C value add play. And I'm ultimately like, man, I'll just, I'll buy a little bit more, but get a much better quality asset in the long run. And, and speaking of Atlanta, right, we were talking with uh, one of the brokers out there and it was funny, there's, there's been a convergence, right, of cap rates, right, where cap, A class cap rates are actually higher than C class uh, cap rates. And this was as of two months ago. And people are like, well, wait, why is that? It's because people are chasing that value add so aggressively, it's pushing caps down, right? So just take that into consideration, folks. You got to admit, this is a 1970s product. You know, how long? That was 50 years ago. Some of this stuff's coming up on its, on its useful life. Now, I'm not saying don't buy a 1970s or even a 1960s deal. There's still plays out there. But just realize that, you know, if you could pay up a little bit and get something that was built in the 90s, 
you're going to have a lot less deferred maintenance, a lot less maintenance issues in general. And, and I think we've learned that too. So it's not, not only just COVID, it's just we've, as we've matured in this business, we've just learned a lot of lessons. And one of them is, you know, that some of these pro properties, you know, plumbings and electrical and HVACs are just rotten and they'll chew you up and they'll spit you out. And so if I can buy something that's 20, 30, 40 years newer and the cap rate's essentially about the same in most cases, why wouldn't you do it? That's how I'd answer that question. Now you might say, well, hey, I'm gonna have a challenge raising five, 10, 20 million dollars. I get it, right? But you know, once you get to that point, you're gonna probably have that same re revelation that we've had. Good. Um, yeah, let me see. How about uh, Jean? Jean, uh, sorry, Jean Allen. Uh, do you have? Did you have low cash on cash on cash um, until the down units were back up? Um, if so, how did your investors react? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we even projected anything for year one. You know, I yeah. mean, it was it was it was going to be it was so minuscule. Maybe it was like percent, right? You know, just to put something down on the board. But you know, at the end of the day, we were under no expectation that there was going to be anything paid out year one, right? Because of that, right? You just it takes time to ramp up cash flow. Um, you know, and, and ultimately on these value add plays, you just need to be upfront with people and, and let them know what the deal is. And most of the time they're going to let you go out there and execute the business plan. Now COVID threw a little bit of a monkey wrench in our business plan as well too. Right. So that one year turned into about 18 months. Uh, but you know, ultimately if we would have held on and, and, and fully gotten everything going, I think we could have refinanced this or even started cash flowing, you know, probably as of right now, but you know, ultimately from the beginning, we were never expecting any cash flow year one. And you always just have to be upfront with your investors, right? You know, as long as you disclose that, then they're fine with it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that's the most important thing is you just got to be upfront with your investors, right? Not everybody's looking for cash on cash year one, right? Those type of different type of property that they might want to invest in. Uh, whereas some people are looking for a, you know, a bigger value add, right? So, I agree. Okay, uh, let me see. Uh, Gina, Gina Allen also asked, uh, could you recap what made your asset management strong? Uh, did you hire somebody to do it or did you do it yourself? So specifically the asset management, I guess what you're talking about. We've hired, uh, we've, we've had an asset manager uh, in that role for several years. You know, I also help oversee that. So it wasn't just me and Ferris, you know, ultimately we, we, we drive different parts of our business and so I can't do the day to day. So that's something that we had delegated out to somebody else for, I think, since 2018. So it's it's been quite some time that we've we haven't necessarily been doing the day to day, but we certainly oversee that. And and ultimately, one part of me and Ferris's you know job description is the acquisition, right, and determining what the business plan is and how the numbers are going to work. And and ultimately, you know, it's the asset manager's job to make sure that the business plan is getting implemented properly. And then on top of that, I would say that. A lot of the success of this deal was really based on the construction. And we had another partner, his name's Oliver Fernandez. Some of you might know him. He's a great guy. He owns his own construction company and he helped manage the construction on this too. So, because that's just as important on this deal as, as asset management is, because if you're not doing the construction, you're not bringing those down units online, you're not going to realize the revenue um, that you need on the deal. So those asset management, construction management working hand in hand is, is, is important and Ultimately, we had a whole team that was helping us, uh, you know, ultimately hit our business plan. Awesome. awesome. Okay. Um, let's see. Angel Williams uh, asked, uh, does, does the floater uh, cover CapEx the way a uh, bridge will? So typically, Freddie doesn't include um, rehab as part of their loan. It's typically going to be loan to value versus loan to cost. That's going to be more of a Fannie product. Um, you know, unless it's just a required repair, then they'll, then they'll you, put it in. And, and your bridge loans are also floaters too. So it's kind of a weird, weirdly worded sentence because bridge loans do cover CapEx. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, it's so different, I right? think really maybe the question was, does the Freddie floater cover it? It's Ben's point. No, and usually not. Yeah. The Fannie one does. Yeah. Whereas sometimes you can get a Fannie loan and it'll size the loan to cost. And then in that case, they'll, they'll lump in some of the rehab into the loan. Right. And so what people just to give everybody a heads up. So loan to value is that the property is 10 million. They're going to give you 70 percent. They're going to give you 7 million, where in some cases, right, they'll do a loan to cost. If it's 10 million, you got a seven million dollar purchase price plus a million dollars in CapEx. 
they'll give you up to 80%, right? You know, so that's kind of how that is. Your loan's actually 8 million in that case. So something to take into consideration, right? And once again, I'd say, ultimately, you know, uh, work with a mortgage broker, work with your lender. Uh, we use Anton Matley from Peak Financing. He's a great guy. Uh, you need to ultimately ask those questions to him because he's going to be in a lot better position than us. Awesome, awesome, okay. Um, I guess the last question here, and this is um, it, that uh, Joanne asked, um, it's just about any open investment, you know, and, and can you talk about it? And I would just say that, you know, I mean, I'll let them talk for what they want to say, but for open investments, Joanne, you, you got to, you really need to contact them directly. So if you're interested in Ben Ferris and partnering with them, you really need to contact them directly, not really do it over sort of a public forum where they would, they would yeah, talk about their, their open investments. That's the folks anyway, but yeah, I mean, you know, drop us a line, Ben at disruptequity.com or Ferris at disruptequity.com, and we're always happy to set up a call. Yeah. Okay, you got that, Joanne. So you just send them a send them an email. They will they'll contact and you can reach out to them. Okay, so let's see. Are we going to go ahead and do some breakout rooms? Yeah, let's go ahead. Let's do it. Let's break do out, it. So. Okay, well, so uh, thank you all very much on that. So I need going, uh, Okay, so I need one of you guys to take over as the as the host since I can't really do this from here. So you want to take this over then, Reverse? Yeah. You want to go ahead and make me a uh, host? Yeah. Okay. Hey, great job, pal. Garrison, we appreciate it, guys. Hopefully, everybody, we added some value. Uh, we like the top shop, so we'll be around for at least one or two breakouts. Yeah, no, I definitely really appreciate you guys uh, doing this. You know, it's like, I think it's great to hear, like, a, the full life cycle of a deal. And, you know, you get to see some things that you don't really get to see or hear about, um, especially on the, on the sales side and, and what, what are the decisions that go into it. So definitely want to thank you and Ferris for uh, uh, giving us some insight into, you know, one of your deals. And since you got five more, so I, I guess we can do this uh, five more times throughout the year, huh? Yeah. <laughs> We're open to it, man. <laughs> yeah. So sounds good. So um, why don't you uh, go ahead and uh, send us into some breakout rooms? So we'll go into breakout rooms for how long do you think? Maybe yeah, uh, 10 minutes. So with that said, right, people, networking is a critical part of multifamily, right? You learn, you meet other people. That turns into partnerships, that turns into friends, right? You do business together, et cetera. So that's why we do breakout rooms. So breakout rooms, for those that have never attended one before, right? Essentially, we'll break up the audience into, you know, a smaller environment, right? Think groups of five to seven people, right? Get to know the other people, talk to them, and, and maybe something, you know, happens, right? So we'll do that for 10 minutes, and then we'll bring everyone back, and then we'll leave it open. So with that said, right, just to recap, next MFM Live will be September 20th, and we look forward to seeing you all there. Thanks.